guys. How you doing? Yeah. Okay, Mike. You, you, I'm sure almost everybody in here plays guitar. Knows knows what a pickup is, right? You go to buy a guitar, you end up with a humbucker or a single chord. That's pretty much all there is right now, because we've developed the art in such a way that um, you can fine tune that single enclosure and those coils using magnets and different winds and resistance to get all the tones you need in that little space. Um, back, back in the 20s and 30s when this art was evolving, that wasn't so. It was brand new, there was a lot of people messing around with electricity, electronics. People understood the basic idea of a coil, a magnetic field, um, ferrous metal going on the top of it, creating an electric response, and that being able to travel through a set of wires. So they, they came up with all kinds of really kind of cool and bizarre, and I think a lot of times just at hand, whatever they could scrounge up to build a pickup with that met the criteria. Um, so this is a patent from 1887. And those of you who understand pickups will understand that is a humbucking pickup. <coughs> you have a north pole, you have a south pole, a horseshoe magnet. You have two coils, reverse wound, connected in series. And this is a driver, or not a driver, but a receiver. It's a metal plate over the top for an early telephone um, transmitter. Now, my theory is this is where the humbucking pickup began, even though that's not wasn't the point. Because when you run an electric charge through this side, an electric charge through this side on on the next frame, I'll show you. Um, go ahead and click it. Oh no, go back to that one. I'm sorry. And so what this did is this basically evolved into the first uh, um, Dobro electric pickup. This is another version of a Dobro electric pickup. If you look at this thing. It is almost identical to that. Coils on, and this is an early audio box pickup, which I believe was ripped off from National Bell Road, but people want to disagree. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a, a earlier, an early, um, um, what, cheap words, yeah, telegraph. And if, if, you apply, if you apply power to this puppy, you will find that it is a reverse wound humbucking. Okay? And it has to be that way because when, when you apply power to it, this turns north and this turns south. And they had to do that by reversing the windings in order to make a north pole and a south pole so they would attract the bar to pull the bar down. You guys had no idea this would be a humbucking pickup, but this is where the stuff started right here. Next time. Okay, this is a, an ad from 1920. And I found earlier ones this, but this is the best copy I had. Notice a violin hooked to a rudimentary resistance amplifier hooked to a speaker. <coughs> this company sold carbon button um, carbon button um, mic receivers. And th this whole thing talks about being able to attach a carbon button to a violin, to a piano, to your wall to listen to your neighbors, <laughs> and, and, be able to, and be able to amplify it as well. Okay, so that you could actually play the violin and be heard, and then actually also transmit the signal of the violin to the next room if you wanted to. Okay? <laughs> so as early as 1920, there was stuff in, in accessible literature out there in the public that tell you how to build an electric instrument. Okay, now this is a this is out of the Diodor file that um, Mary had talked about earlier. This is um, Theodore's original October 1, 1922, drawing he built to himself of the design he had for an electric violin. He has right here the bridge and the transmitter button, which is a carbon button, hooked to the bridge right here. And he also is using a rheostat for volume control. Um, he uses a Magnavox amp. Um, and I've got literature from him where he ordered information from the Magnavox company with prices and everything, and he actually bought a couple of these. And he applied for this patent about a year later, and uh, he was actually touring. With, and one, one of the claims of this patent, which I found really curious, was that using the rheostat and using different sizes of horns, he could basically have a synthesized violin that he could make sound like horns, a saxophone, wherever he wanted to uh, claim it, okay? Claiming. Lots of claims back then that I think were mental rather than actual happening. Um, and he was touring with his electric 
violin on the East Coast by 1925. We have um, newspaper articles talking about him touring with this thing. So we have a, a guy who was a professional musician, decided to figure out a way to build an electric instrument and, and increase the volume. Next. Yeah, this is uh, the stronger voice name stuff. Uh, Matt went over this, so we, we can burn my hat. <laughs> Go. Yeah. Okay, this, this is my stronger voice name. Well, I'm not sure any more than it is. It is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I got this years ago. Uh, it met all the criteria for a stronger voice name. Um, I got all excited. There was no research on it. I had done 20 years of previous research. I figured that's what it was. I am not the kind of guy who can't admit I'm wrong if I am, so I am trying to prove that I am wrong. Wait, hang on, before you do that, I have to, sorry, I have to interject and okay. tell you the story, because I was, when I was uh, starting to do that, I was starting to do uh, work on uh, researching this. This is when I first met uh, it, and I had done all this research on the Strawberg one, you know, wasn't any dug up, um, uh, uh, you know, things from the music trades and gone uh, through I found, well, let's say, some of these, you know, these articles, and I had written a pretty good description of what I thought this must be based on going through there, which was wrong. And uh, I wrote, you know, tell me, he said, "Yeah, uh, you're, I read your, you know, your description, and you're just not even close." And I'm like, "Well, okay, how do you know this?" It was because I got one, but don't feel bad; no one knows. And I'm like, "Well." <laughs> I, kept, I really kept a low profile clicking all this early stuff because I didn't want people to know what I was doing so they would not jack up the prices on me, basically. Um, the way this thing works, the stronger voice thing out there, is you've got an internal um, speaker uh, driver. And this metal rod here, which is bent, it's how I got it, I straightened it out so it actually worked, pushes this little reed that vibrates right in here between these two magnets and between a set of coils. And this is actually a humbucky pickup as well. Okay, next. Okay, now this is a really early electric violin by uh, Victor File. This was his this was his original patent. This this picture here was actually in the Deodor file. And it was the original patent picture sent to the patent office by this, by Victor File to prove that he had actually built one and that it works. And um, it, it basically works the same way as the stronger voice name. It's got a bridge with a bolt going through it with a, um, a metal armature that goes over the top of a magnetic foam. This is a violin that he built a few years later. You see actually this violin in this picture um, from magazine in 1933. And you can see there's two coils right here. And it has a bar armature that goes over the top of the two coils. And the bar armature sitting right here works a lot like a vivitone. Um, looking at it, it looks humbucking, but I'm not going to claim that it is. This is the pickup that's actually in the violin now. And it, it, it's unique because it has the bar armature over the two horseshoe magnets, but it has the coil wrapped around the bar armature rather than underneath the bar armature. It's the only thing I've seen like, like that. And it's not, it doesn't work with this patent. This was his first patent, this was his second patent, this is 28, this is 33. And this violin looks to have been built sometime just after that and converted. And I have two of these, um, and one has, this one's a converted one, the other one looks like it was built originally that way. Next slide. Uh, this is just a, a blow up of the article uh, showing him holding the original pickup that was in it, um, August of 33. And look at, just go back. Let, let's check this out. A cello. Oh, yeah. I would kill to find that sucker. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, can you go back? Also, just sorry. Yeah. Right. Notice the is that a uh, like a lion uh, uh, scroll? Is that a lion headed scroll on the? No, right. On this no. Is that no? Okay, just my eyes. This this is the violin here. Okay. This is the one that was in the magazine okay. article that's been converted. Mm -hmm. And you can see the bridge sitting on top of the pickup. You can see the coil that surrounds the bar armature. Next. This, this is the pickup out of the violin. So you can see how it sits on to, over the top of the magnets. Okay, next. This is 
very good on the list. This is Albino's number 97. I have to throw that in there because it is a, uh, a pickup of the period. Now, go ahead and go next. One of the reasons I, I'm doing this is because well, I'm nuts. And the other reason is because Matthew and Harry and I have for years been grappling over what to call this stuff. Okay? I came up with direct string driven. Harry doesn't like parts no. of that. Matthew comes up with stuff. So what we're trying to do is I, I had a discussion with Matthew last summer. I said, look, I think what we need to do is figure out how to organologically um, categorize all this stuff. It needs a taxonomy. Do, 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 do the family tree of where a pickup came from, what the different technologies were, what the branches were, the, the, the little skims off of the branches, which ones made it, which ones didn't, all that kind of stuff. Because there's a lot going on in this period. And, and, and Matthew says, yeah, we can start with this, this. And I said, yeah, but dude, we got to know what's out there. i got to be able to look at them. I'm, I'm a tactile guy. I got to be able to see it. So I decided to start taking all my stuff apart and taking pictures and putting them together so we could actually have it. This is basically a historical chronology of the Rickenbacker pickup. This is the pickup that's in um, Gage Burroughs prototype. This is in, in um, another one of the museum's um, instruments, uh, Electric Spanish. This is a pickup that's in Bobby Carlos's prototype fry pan. This is in my, anyway, it goes all the way down. And you can see how they change. You've got big, heavy magnet, big, heavy magnet, big, heavy, 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 and then little, and then big, and then little magnets. And the coils change. The air gap between the magnet and the coils change. The size of the, of the coil changes. There's just all these little things that they went through. And I thought, the only way I'm ever going to figure this out is to do crap like this so that I can look at it all at once and we can pass it around and we can decide how to describe this stuff. Yeah. Wait, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, go ahead. Can you back up to that time? So the, um, these pickups that you're finding are, so it's not in the sense that they're all unique, that they were kind of building them with kind of what was mm -hmm. around and available, it was that there were sections of 100 instruments built one way and then 50 instruments built the next way, like that? Um, yeah, it seems like all, the, all these big heavy pickups um, seem to have been built in the, put in the instruments that were built before probably, we think Matt, March of 33? Yeah. And then, and then they went to the A22 just about then. And when the A, even before the A22 comes along, the heavy pick, this big heavy pickup disappears. And we go to this lighter weight pickup. And in fact, I've got an Electro. With, this is my Electro PS, Electric Spanish. That's serial number 151. That still has the Electro stencil on the peg head, not, not the badge, and it has a light pickup in it. Um, we've, we've never found an A22 with a heavy pickup, um, and so that's all we could surmise. I, I don't think with heavy pickup instruments, honestly, I don't think there's more than 50 of them ever built. So the one, just, I'm sorry, and the one anomaly uh, that, that doesn't fit that is uh, <coughs> the, the uh, electric um, double bass that they made. Uh, I know the two examples I've seen both have the heavy pickups. Yeah, they have the heavy pickups. They have the heavy pickups. But they were obviously made, I mean, uh, but looking at the coils, they were made later. They were. They must have had a couple of those magnets around still. Well, no, no, it might have been the fact that they figured that magnet would work better with that scale length and all oh, yeah, no, the strings with that little teeny bit of metal that they were just putting around the string because they were just wrapping a gut string with a ferrous iron metal to, to be able to excite the pickup. And, may, and so that little more powerful magnet may have been next. So this is a period of like five months here? I'm sorry? That was like a period of five months, those pickups? Oh, probably uh, August or so of 32 to March or so of 33, so not very long. Right, yeah. nice. This is this is my electro out there. Um, I'm right, just next. Okay, <laughs> this, this, this was the next um, production electric guitar to come out. Um, so we had we had with we had the Starboard Voice today, which I don't believe was ever a production guitar. It was just an idea that was consumed, and a couple things were made and moved on. Then we have the Vivitone, uh Spring of '32. Then we have the Rickenbacker. Wrote that in um, by probably early August of '32. Then the National Dobro Company started doing the all electrics um, by um, you know probably June trade show of '33. Um, with a design that never worked, that was supposedly ripped off from uh, Tupmark, which I think is crap. Go on, next one. This is the pickup that's 
in the, the Dover Hall Electric. Um, there are a couple of these, and I own two of them. And you can't, you can't really, I mean, there, I'm, I'm sorry, don't miss it. There are, there are a number of these. But there are a couple of these that I believe were of the original 10 or 12 built with the old pickup that didn't work that they recalled back to the factory because I have two of them that inside you can't really see on this one. You can see where the stuff was glued in that facilitated the original pickup. They brought it back, tore them out, and you can see part of the glue here and, and did this pickup. Now, the one thing I didn't mention about the, the, the real pad in prototype electric Spanish that Eric has here at the museum, I don't know what you guys, what the world wants to define as a solid body guitar. Okay, you've strum a strap, you strum a Les Paul, you hear the guitar. It's not noiseless, okay? So as far as I'm concerned, when you have a guitar that does not rely on the resonating chamber, the body of the guitar is basically mute. And, and it, it's there to amplify the strings using the pickup. To me, that is the definition of a solid body guitar. Because you cannot pick up a solid body guitar, strum it, and not hear it. It did not happen. And a lot of these guitars are as quiet unplugged as a Les Paul or a Strat. They just don't have, this, 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 this metal thing here that this thing's on probably weighs three and a half pounds. It does, this guitar does not vibrate, okay? And the Ropadium uh, prototype that Eric has here has a wooden block built inside that goes from the back all the way to the top. That's probably that square that keeps that whole thing from vibrating. Dude, it's a solid body guitar. I don't, you know, that's what they were going for, was to keep the resonance of the body. Sorry, can I interject here? Uh, and this is a discussion for another time. Um, I think the whole thing about solid body, hollow body, and semi-hollow body is probably one of the most misunderstood things, because you were exactly right. Uh, these instruments were not designed to be played acoustically. And so what I would argue is that it's the intent of the maker, in other words, was it designed to be heard without amplification? The answer is no. So whether or not there's a, a, a chamber or it makes noise, of course, you're absolutely right, it makes noise when you, right. when you strum it. That's kind of a red herring. It's, we think about that, but that, that's actually nonsense. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and this has a full, the full original sound bowl. This is basically just a Dobro acoustic guitar that they took the cone out, they took the cone out of, and stuck this contraption inside. The top doesn't move. It's it's plywood. It's uh, yeah, next. It's, <laughs> it's a solid body guitar. Now this, this is a Dobro electric electric. This was actually designed to be an acoustic and electric guitar. Um, this pickup comes from the underneath that sits on a horseshoe magnet inside and the two coils come up and they come up under the string, but it still has the complete resonator system of an acoustic guitar with a custom built spider to hold the pickup system and to hold the bridge and everything. This was the first acoustic electric guitar in 1934. Next. This is a, a another, this, these are kind of underrated guitars. Everybody says Gibson had the first professional ES guitar. BS. This is a national from, 19, from, from trade show of 1935. Uh, well over a year, year and a half before Gibson came out with theirs. Um, it's got that same pickup in it under, under a cover. And the reason for the big cover is they knew that shielding was important. important. Even though these guitars have humbucking pickups in them, they still made sure they were shielded. This is a completely professional guitar. Um, Archstop uh, built by Regal, um, specifically manufactured for the purpose of installing that pickup by the National Bill World Company. Next. This is the pickup that's in that guitar. Well, this is not that guitar. This is a pickup like that. Um, this is one Eric actually gave me years ago. Um, and you can see this has height adjustability. It has this metal bar that goes across here that actually moves the coils up and down. Got the big horseshoe magnet. It's shielded from the top with this heavy brass. This thing weighs, boy, over two pounds. It's a heavy thing. And, and the inside of that guitar <coughs> has two very big sound posts that sit on um, discs that go from the back to the front. It ain't acoustic. I'm sorry. Next. Hey, William. Yeah. I, just because I know you own guitars with that pickup, how does that pickup compare volume-wise to what Gibson came out with a year later? 
Volume-wise, it's fine. Tone-wise, it's completely different because it's sitting next to the bridge. Right. So it's got a lot brighter sound. It hasn't got the big mellow sound like mm -hmm. a Gibson would have. But I think if you if you plug, I haven't done this. If you plug them both into an EH 150 amp, I think volume-wise they're going to be about the same. I need to do that, Pete. Good idea. This is the pickup without the cover, and you can see the the double coil. These are reverse wound in series with with uh, opposing north and south poles. This is a humbucking pickup. This was in those guitars by late 1933. So Seth Glover and Gibson did not even come close to being the first humbucking pickup. Next. This is an interesting company. This is Volume Tone. Everybody calls this the killer company because this pickup has no, it looks like a humbucking pickup, which it kind of sort of is. It has no magnet in the center. Those are um, inert ferrous metal bars. Um, this is the, one of the very earliest examples. I think Eric has one a lot like this in, in the case out there. This is a custom built, as far as I'm concerned, the first custom color sparkle guitar in the world. <laughs> Probably 1935. This is a Washburn guitar with that pickup. The one you can the, you know, sell, you can attach to the guitar, uh, like uh, they played with Milk Brown uh, on one of the first recorded letter guitars. And the way this thing worked was, and I'm not sure it worked this way at first. Um, this, this patent is at least two years applied for after the launch of this instrument. Um, and there, there are descriptions that you can just carry a permanent magnet with you and you can magnetize the strings and play it, uh, which is what uh, Bob Dunn did with Mill Brown. Um, or you can plug into this amplifier, you can flip this switch, you can cause thousands of volts to go through these two solenoids that turn into electromagnets that magnetize the strings above the pickup. You turn it off about three seconds and you've got a pickup because now you've got your magnet up here and you've got your coils down here. Now there's some conjecture whether or not that turns it into a humbucker because they are reverse wound in series, but I've not used that to magnetize a set of strings and put you know something over the top to tell me if there's a north up here and a south down here up they're magnetized. Oh. I can only assume that maybe because this would turn into north and this would turn into south because they're reverse wound series that that would be the case, but until I do it, I don't know. Next. This is a, a prototype guitar by Victor File, the guy who did the earlier, the earlier violin. Dude, 19, late 34, early 35, cutaway electric guitar. Find me another one. Uh, this, is, this is a very interesting guitar. And I, think, I don't think he built only this one. You can tell he's a violin builder because of the way it's built inside. When I got it, the neck was falling off. But this, this unit, this Those unit, builders. well, it has a, you know, it's got a metal string and it's got like a, a, a mortise and tenon joint that's, you know, three eighths wide. It's just like a violin, it ain't gonna hold strings. Next. This is the pickup unit that's sitting inside of it. And you see this big, huge chunk of magnet going around here. And you can see this little teeny bar going down here. That's, that connects to a, a metal bar that the bridge sits on, kind of like a, a, a vivitone. Next. Okay, this is actually the speaker that this thing is cut from. And this is the patent for the speaker. And right here it says you can use it as a receiver or a transmitter. Okay, and all he did, all he did was took this puppy here and cut this part off of it and stuck it into the side, inside his guitar and made it function. These two posts here, it's upside down. These two posts here are what the bridge sits on. Right. Next. That's just a close-up view so you can see the, uh, the rod coming down. This is a lot like what Stromberg Voice and A, the thing I've got out there, um, did on a metal rod. The bridge sitting on top of the two posts. Next. It's another view showing how it works. Next. This is just a, a better pick up picture of the speaker. Next. Oh, no, back, back. And you can see it was patented by 34. Next. Another view of the speaker next. Okay, th this is so we can see what the whole thing looks like with the bridge sitting on top of the two posts that are supported by the metal bar. And I know it's after the patent because it's actually got the patent number on it. Yeah, this huge piece of phenolic inside that holds it all. Next. And that's the speaker. You can see where they cut it off right there and just use this back part 
for the speaker. Next. This is this is this is a, a, this is the underside of it. And this is you know, it's another example of, of, uh, of things guys were coming up with in the 30s using technologies available um, to be able to, you know, produce an instrument that they could increase the volume or change the tone or whatever they wanted to do to that electric signal. Next. This is, this is one of the coolest guitars I've seen. This was, this ad is in Montgomery Ward magazine for spring summer of 36. And I know from experience of going through the Gibson archives that if you were going to get something in the spring summer catalog for Montgomery Ward, you had to have it developed and sent to them as a sample by the September of the year before. So they would have had to have this guitar ready to go by September of 35. That's important. This guitar is it's a, it's a regular, like dreadnought sized guitar. Has no F holes. Okay, see no F holes. It has a top on it. It reminds me of the story Les Paul told, where he had the Larson brother building a thick top. This has a over three eighths inch plywood top on it that is um, braced like a tank. This thing has zero acoustic property. It's almost quieter than a Stratum plug. Do you own one of these? I own. The two existing examples. Okay. And and one and that one's out there. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah this one's out there. Okay. Next. Okay. Th th this is the second example. Go back. Right. Okay. See, this one has a wood surround around it. That's the first example. That's like the one we've got out there next. Then the next catalog, they changed it to a metal surround. I have this one as well. And then this also, they came out with it with a K and cast aluminum. I've only ever seen. One of these, I own the carcass. I don't have, I have a pickup like it that goes on another guitar, um, but they used a piezo pickup on this puppy, on this cast aluminum guitar. <coughs> Next. This is the pickup. This is what's so interesting about this pickup. This is a 12 individual pole, two for each string, humbucking pickup. This thing is so quiet, it will scare you to death. And it's not even grounded to the tail piece. It is humble. It's all shielded. Um, it's individual coils are all wrapped and, and, and done one side one way, one side the other way. And tell me this isn't a modern humbucker with a single magnet of reverse polarity going through the center. Anybody you've seen the inside of a humbucker pickup knows that's exactly what a modern humbucking looks like. Next. This, this is the, the instrument that is making me rethink the Stromberg voice and anything. This is a Lord's mandolin built by Gibson from 1936. This is a very interesting attached item here. This, this, this bridge pickup did not come originally on this instrument. It does not fit the top of the instrument properly. I believe this pickup predates by years this instrument, although I can't prove it. Next. Okay. You can see how somebody had to shim the feet to get to fit the top of the instrument. You can see this little wheel inside. I wish I had to put the, the stronger um, or the uh, file patent next to this, because that is it almost exactly his pickup. You know, notice that it's quarter inch jack. That's a later edition. See those yeah. holes? I surmise that those are our telephone jack holes, like the stronger voice that I use. Next. And you can see how it, it, this, what this little puppy does here is it adjusts this rod up and down. And you can see how well this bridge is built. This is not somebody's garage shop project. This is something, a manufacturer. This is something real. Next. And you can, this is just the other view of it showing how it goes through. Next. This is the pickup. I put it on this mount so you can see how it has this ferrous metal disc that adjusts height-wise for volume over the top of a humbucking pickup. It's a humbucking pickup, kids. North and south horseshoe magnet with um, reverse wound, um, reverse pol um, polarity. Uh, it's this, this mounted under the inside of that mandolin. That was fun trying to figure out how to get the thing out of there. Um, next. How'd you get it out of there? It was it was some little like hooks and wires and stuff. Ship it above. Yeah, I, I really it works. I really didn't want to break this one. Um, and you can 
see the skillful art with which this thing is designed. This, this was not somebody's first rodeo. Um, and I, I've got lots of pictures of, of early um, microphone technology that has the same sort of laminated magnet with the humbucking pickup design coils inside of it. And, and I, I'm almost sure that's where this came from, was out of a, a pre-existing piece of technology. But I haven't been able to find this one yet. Next. Ah, oh, Slingerland. The first solid body electric guitar. Um, all this electric Spanish one, pickguard, um, neck pulled out of the body, um, all solid wood, kind of diminutive little small guitar. Um, probably late 1935. Next. And this is the pickup. These are, these are old pictures. I don't have this guitar available to me right now. Um, got the uh, horseshoe, the ends of the horseshoe magnet, and it got six pole pieces, a lot like that Regal had. It's always been my contention that Regal built these. Um, I don't have any proof. Nobody can say I'm right, nobody can say I'm wrong. It's just you look at the skill level, you look at the design qualities, and it just like it, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, maybe it's a duck. Um, and this also humbucking design. You've got two sets of three coils, uh, wound uh, reverse, reverse magnetic, polarity in series. And that's just a little better view of showing the six coils in the pickup. Next. KK. This was one of the first I could find um, piezo attachment pickups you could buy. Now Gibson used a piezo internal pickup they got from Lion and Healy um, in 33. Uh, we figured maybe they did 20, 28 of those things. Um, when, and and, and in, in the Gibson shipping records, when they're sending those things back and forth to, to Lion and Huey, they call them, they call them electros. Um, don't know what they look like, have no clue. Uh, this just goes on top of the guitar. You can see how it's attached. This has a little, this is a little different model. has a volume knob here. The pickup is attached to the top of the guitar. And this little unit right here pushes against the bridge and picks up the vibration of the bridge. And, and um, I looked at the patents on it, and I think I think they're in here. I hope I do. Anyway, and then you can buy this is the arch top unit, and this is the flat top unit. Next. Hey, Lynn. Yep. Question on the the that's the earliest K thing I've ever seen. You always uh, read that the Stromberg voice in that became K. Mm -hmm. I mean, you read that in a lot of. Is right. there anything in between, you know, 28 and 36, 37 that would seem like it's the same people or the same designers? No, you know, there could they, they could be you know in in house projects and stuff, but nothing that uh, that, that I know of that anybody's scared of. I would love to see it. But, you know, I'm always looking for this stuff. So. Yeah, it seems like the earliest K knowledge is real sketchy. It, it is. It is. Yeah. There, there is, is a letter in the sorry. There's a letter in the Rickenbacker archives when they were going through their initial um, well, they were going through a lawsuit with uh, Benjamin Meisner in thirty. Seven, where uh, uh, somebody from K, though they were aware of what they had that in that time been done, because they make the claim said, well, "Look, we've been making electric guitars since 1928," and he kind of puts it as a as an offhand right, comment. Yeah. So, right. you know, they were. It, it's uh, yeah. Meisner was suing for licensing, and K did buy a license. You can find very few really early Oahu's that Kate built for the, the, the Oahu School with the Porsche pickup on it. And uh, very few of them have the Meisner licensing tag on the back. I've seen three, I think. This is also a real interesting pickup from that period. This was done by Sound Projects out of Chicago. This is basically a condenser pickup. The way it works is you've got a copper, you've got a set of copper plates, and in between the set of copper plates, you've got a sort of plastic that folds in between each copper plate, and this makes a big zigzag. Okay, um, it sits. It sits in this in, in half. This at the top. It's and then and then under this sits this piece of felt. Under that sits this saddle. It sits on top of the of the um, composition of plates of plastic, and this sits on a charged brass base. And you have to have a special amplifier to play this thing. It won't work over everything because the amplifier have to supply power to this portion of the pickup 
And then this is the ground, so you've got a common, you've got a hot and a common that this flows through. And by virtue of the strings going over the top of this pickup through the saddle, it, it, it you know it, it presses and releases the space in between those plates and allows a certain amount of current to flow through. Of course, when they're farther apart, less current. When they're closer together, more current. Okay, so that's how that's how the pickup works. Is there? It's a it's a current flow situation. Um, and this and this is actually electrostatic. I'm sorry. This is actually electrostatic. No. It's not. No, it's condensed. Okay, condensed. It's condensed. But how do, how does this? Because I mean, it looks like you're describing a voltaic pile. I'm sorry. It looks like you're describing a voltaic pile. Uh, it's not though, no. because this 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 has a charge yeah. applied. Right. There's no. Yes. Yeah. It, it doesn't make its own charge. It has a charge applied. Gotcha. So it's a resistance. It's like a carbon button, early carbon button. That's the same way it worked. You had current flowing through it, and when you smashed it and let it open, it, it was a resistor to the current, and that's how you changed the volume. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, it took me years. This thing said, every, everyone I've ever found, I own about four of them. I have a Spanish one as well. They all say pat, patent pending. I, could, I just stumbled across the patent, I swear to God, six weeks ago, accidentally looking for Guitar Street, because Matt and I were having a conversation about did somebody actually invent a special string for an electric guitar pickup? So, well, that, and it, Matt's always coming up with those kind of things. And so I thought, well, I'm going to look. So I started looking for that, and I ran across this patent. I'm like, holy crap, there it is. So next. This is a early Harmony. Uh, these were available by 37? Now, Arian was talking earlier about uh, the uh, Vivitone and the extra pull off of the unused end of the magnet, okay? And that was, of course, so you had a north pole and a south pole, you have a set of strings, and like the Rickenbacker pickup where the strings go in between the magnet, that makes a magnetic flux field, okay? So you aren't using the other side of the horseshoe magnet. So what they did, and a number of companies do this, these are not, by far not the only guys who do this. You've got this horseshoe magnet sitting here, this is where the coils are. You've got a metal bolt bar that goes across these three coils. Okay, so you're, you're magnetizing the coils that way. On this side, unseen, you've got this metal lug that goes through. This is the underside of this, which is actually the top of the pickup. This other end of the horseshoe magnet magnetizes this metal bar that sits just in front of the coils. So you've got a south polarity over here and a north polarity over here. So you've got a continuous magnetic flux field for the strings to go through to give it um, a bigger field to generate more power. And, you know, I don't know if that's a humbucking pickup or not. I haven't figured that one out because it's got three coils and I, have, I, I don't want to ruin it and take it apart to find out. So when I get a dead one, I'll take it apart. Okay. Just before you go, no, before you go, yeah. uh, go what year was this? this uh, these were available by 37. Okay. Late 36, early 37 in the Sears catalog. Right. It's under the brand Supertone. Uh, just one strange thing, not on the pickup, but looking at the F hole on that. Uh, it's a Harmony. What's that? It's a Harmony guitar. Yeah, but the, those F holes, uh, that's kind of uh, early for um, F holes to be that abstract. At that time, they, they tended to still be much more violin like and just to have that kind of. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I've never really gotten into that, but you know, Harmony had I think they set themselves off with Gibson and the sleekness and the defender and the refined Harmony was kind of the you know the this, this third tier manufacturer yeah. that three stuff No, I'm just saying it, it just it's looking already it's just sort of starting to mm -hmm. uh, it, that's just for the three it's a little early to look that abstract, and that's all. You can cut that a lot faster than that was probably the point. Yeah, this you know it's a really cheesy guitar that's not real flame, it's pain. <laughs> Next <laughs> And that, that's the pickup, so you, can, so you can see it all the way around. You can see the horseshoe magnet supported by a metal block, and of course you've got to have some way to maintain it. And it has this really nice chromed plate over the top. And you've got the poles here, and you've got that extra magnetic field here that, of course, does the, the flux jump. Next. Uh, my buddy, I'll you know. I'm trying to do these kind of in chronological order of uh, my best guess of when the technologies presented themselves. Alvino here is holding the R&D Gibson guitar.
garden now sits in the Seattle EMP Museum. I had this, I had the opportunity to, to deal with this guitar back in the 80s and early 90s, and I don't have any great pictures of it because I didn't know I'd take pictures back then at all. Um, this was just, a, I have it on my wall. It, it, it's bent now because Albino just had it thrown in a closet. Uh, and it was, you know, one time it was straight, it's a, it's a brass frame that in uh, the uh, early spring, late spring, early summer of 1935, he and John Kudelak in the Chicago Land Eagle Warehouse built this thing, this frame in order to test pickups. The only part that even looks like Gibson is the headstock, because Gibson had rented the space and hired John Kudelak as a, as a consulting audio engineer <coughs> to help the world's number one electric guitar player help Gibson design an electric pickup and he played a Rickenbacker and they were trying to get around the Rickenbacker design which they, Albino had to go on tour with Hyatt's band and so he abandoned the project and went up to, up to Kalamazoo. This, this is an, an interesting design, it's, it's very Rickenbacker-ish, um, although it's got a really weak magnetic, magnetic field. I, I, I can't imagine these started off as magnets, I think they must have tried to magnetize them. Um, it's, you can see the pole pieces were ground on a, on a grinder. Um, <clears throat> when you talk garage project where everything started, all the ideas, like Matt was saying, you know, somebody in their garage, their workshop, their kitchen, whatever, that had crazy ideas just went out and, you know, doing crap by yourself by hand with tools was what you did back then. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't go to the local garage and have it done. You did it yourself. And uh, so this is what they came up with. Um, when I first saw it, it had a cable hooked to it, but when I finally sold it to EMP and the cable was missing, I asked Elvino, oh, where is it? He goes, I don't know. So, and it had a, uh, a plug on the end of the cable that went into a tube socket that went into the amplifier. Um, so this, this, this is Gibson's, as far as I know, Gibson's first attempt at trying to come up with an electric guitar, and that would have been the spring of 1935. Next. Oh, that's in the wrong place. Next. Okay, everybody knows what this is. This is a Gibson guitar. But this is an interesting one. This is an L7 left hand that predates an ES250 by a year. This is actually Gibson's second 17-inch electric guitar. Um, and I, I put that up there because this, the pick up we'll look at came out of this. Go next. Okay, this is the patent for the what we call now the Charlie Christian pickup. Um, and notice whose name's on it? So Guy Hart, really designed Guy Hart, President of Gibson. He didn't design that, did You know, and I, I used to have conversations with Walt Fuller, the guy who was Gibson's electric engineer back in the 30s, who designed this pickup, designed this pickup. Um, and as I got deeper into research, I kept looking at this pickup going, I'll be damned if that isn't just a dope room. And Albino left out of Chicago in, uh, let's see, you got there in May, June, July, July of 35. And they had a working prototype, a working guitar ready to ship by October. And that time period always bothered me. <laughs> and I had talked to, to Mr. Fuller a number of times on the phone. He had told me about the four A's, um, the different cats at the companies of K and Harmony and National Dobro and Gibson would all get together <coughs> once a month in Chicago and hang out and talk shop, okay? And I, I actually confirmed him on this. I said, why does Guy Hart's name on this patent if you invented this pickup? He said, well, Mr. Hart was the president. It was an important invention. And I thought, you know, Gibson invented a lot of crap the company's president's name wasn't on. And I said, so, there's no way that you took the design from National Dobro and just changed the magnets. And he got really quiet. <laughs> Next. So this, this is the pick up the snag guitar. You know, solid blade. You've got, uh, you got two magnets. You've got the north side and the south side. Goes through a, a regular coil. I mean, not, not rocket science. Not anywhere near as sophisticated as a National Dobro pickup. But by this time, National Dover was not using the double coil anymore. They were using a single coil on a horseshoe magnet with a split blade. Next. <coughs> this is just so you can get a better view of the pickup, how it's mounted inside the guitar. Uh, 
these go up to the top of the guitar, three screws go through, so you can tilt the pickup side to side, and this will, and they sit on springs, so you can adjust the pickup for, um, for action height, um, for volume. Next. This is Albino's custom built console brand. Um, the first Gibson pedal steel guitar, factory pedal steel guitar. He had them add these little uh, palm levers to it, and they also had three or four pedals on the floor there. When I got it, it looked like this. He had completely taken it apart, and the neck that used to be here went into his electro arc because he hated the 22 and a half inch scale, and this is a 25 inch scale electro arc that was custom built. The reason I took this picture was it shows the new Alnico horseshoe style magnet. And you can see now they separated the bar into two pieces so you don't have opposing and magnetic fields here canceling out the center section of the pickup being able to work right. And they've also got individual pole pieces, which everybody thinks actually started on the ES250. Nah, sorry, right here. Next. And that's the pickup with the coil on it. Uh, they all have a blue mark. And I think that is. Uh, the, the front or back side, because they all have the same polarity when you put them. I use a little, one of those dashboard compasses with a little ball, and I just put it next to the magnets when I get pickups and, and record what the polarity is. Next. That's the, just the set of bars on it. Next. And we don't need to see that. Next. Okay, this is an interesting pickup. This is Charlie Christian pickup that's stuck inside a 1935 Cromwell G6. I don't know when it was put in. From the design and the pieces and parts that it's made out of, it could be anywhere from 1937 to 1939. But the one unique thing is, is that they designed it with adjustable pole pieces that go through the coil. Um, I, I know it's not original guitar. Cromwell never had a guitar like that. I can see where they, when they cut the hole, the paint's missing. Um, but it's obviously something Gibson built uh, for somebody that ordered the thing. Um, as far as I know, this. I don't know. I know it's Gibson's first adjustable height pickup. I don't know, but it's got to it's got to be in there somewhere. Next, and that just shows basically it's just a regular Charlie Christian, but it's got the six adjustable poles. And what's interesting is this is a really, I mean it's basically a P90, right, with the magnets mounted here instead of underneath the two the two sides. Um, next. And that just shows it with the, with the bar that goes through and the mounting and the screws. Next. This is Gibson's prototype electric violin. An interesting story on this puppy. They, uh, they brought this out of the 1938 trade show. The guys from National Dilbert walked down to the Gibson booth and looked at it and went, you can't rip us off. And uh, Guy Hart instructed the guys at Gibson to send this to National Dilbert to have them take it apart and look at it. And if they were interfering with any of Bill Gross technology, they would not manufacture the violin. If they did, they did not. This is the only one in the world. You can see that. And, and it's interesting because the sides, it's not, a, it's not a regular violin. The top is thick pressed plywood. The back is thick pressed plywood. The sides are cut out of solid blocks of wood. They're about a quarter inch thick. So it, it's, a complete, it's an instrument that was completely built to facilitate this technology. Um, this is this, uh, you know, I haven't had, this violin is down in California. I haven't seen this thing for years. So I haven't had a chance to throw and see if this is a north-south and this is a humbucking pickup. But you can see how hand-built it is with the paper uh, for the bobbins and the bend over coils. And it's basically just the inside of a microphone. I mean, it's not, there's, there's not, all this stuff is just different renditions of the same idea by guys using what they had to be able to, solve a problem. Next. This is an ES-12. This predates the Gibson ES-250, which is supposed to be Gibson's first 17-inch electric guitar by a year and a half. This is the only one known, and it has a height-adjustable Charlie Christian pickup in it. This is a completely different design than the last one we looked at. This one actually had a patent. Um, interesting, they patented it on what looks like an acoustic lap slide. Um, don't know what's up with that, but that's what they use for the picture. Uh, got the regular Charlie Christian bar magnets. It's, it's not adjustable here for height because they want you to be able to adjust it here. And you can't quite see, but right here there's little holes in the pole pieces where you stick a little, a little metal bar in and you can 
instead of having a, a slot on top, you can adjust it with this by virtue of these holes and turn it with a little, little metal bar. Um, next, and that's that's the pickup out end. So you can see you can see where it goes up here, and it's got this, it's got the, uh, the split pole piece. It's actually a pretty damn good sounding pickup too, and it's it's uh, the coil is Gibson um, about mm, October or so of '38 started wrapping their coils so they had more output. This is one of the ones with more output. Next, and that's just taking apart so you can get a little better view of how this. And he really goes to a lot of trouble to describe this slot and how this is built and these and these threaded uprights and stuff. Um, the dude was the inventor was really into that, and I don't know why Gibson never produced it because about the same time as this, um, Epiphone was coming out with a true balance type adjustable pickup, and Gibson wouldn't wouldn't do that until they actually did the, the long P90 and the ES300, 1940, uh, 41 actually, 40. Next. And this is Les Paul's prototype Gibson ES300. Started out as a 1936 L7, and it's not here in the case. Um, and you can see it has, this is when they were using the smaller El Nico magnets. It's basically just a big P90, um, which the pickup Gibson designed in the late 30s, but really, because the thing was in the first gold tops and all the first electric stuff that came out in, in the 50s, um, that it has that great rock and roll crunch to it. Um, this is this is unique from any other pickup of this design I've ever found. I can I can tell how these were actually put into a vise and hand bent. All the other ones you see are rounded because they were put into a press. This has no celluloid going around it protecting it. The screws have all been hand hand ground to that size. None of them are the same size. When I first got this and took it apart, I was like, oh my god. Next. This is a, an interesting adaptation of a Charlie Christian pickup. This is a sound bowl pickup they sold before they actually sold the electric Spanish guitar, just after they invented the cast aluminum lap slide. Uh, it's basically a big Charlie Christian pickup stuck in a, a metal plate that goes in the sound bowl of the guitar with a volume knob next. It is a contraption. It weighs a lot. I'm sure it dampened the heck out of the guitar. And it has the heavy bar magnets like the Hawaiian guitar had. And I would have thought if they would have manufactured these after the Hawaiian guitar, and when they were doing the ES, they would have used the lighter magnet. So my assumption is that this came before the electric Spanish guitar was launched in November of 36. Next. Look at this the way that goes down. It's got a, 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 a flexible spring that goes down that controls the, the, the volume pot underneath. Um, and, and this, when they originally sold it, this was round. But the guy realized he couldn't get the cable out of the sound hole, so he cut the, the flat spot off so he could get the cable from the pickup out of the sound hole so he could actually use the thing. Next. That's the undersider. And it works in the sound It actually sounds pretty good. Uh, next. This is the second generation of Gibson attachment pickup. Uh, this is a, a basically a P90. This is the patent for it here. It, but this is a built like more like a Firebird pickup, with this a solid um, metal magnet through the center with the coils going around it. And it's, you know, basically a dark the arm and monkey on a stick. Uh, got a little, a little pot for the volume control, attaches to the guitar. You, know, you can put it on about any, any arch top guitar you wanted to. Next. And this is the pickup off the guitar. Next. And of course, I've got to do that. Next. <laughs> oh, that's in the wrong place. Next. Next. Okay, this, this is Vega. Uh, I, there are a number of, of uh, renditions of, of these Vega lap slides. The first ones were truly humbucky with a reverse wound um, series um, uh, combined opposite magnetic poles. Um, the later ones that have the two big horseshoe magnets in them are not on my account. Because the pole that goes over the pickup are both the same polarity. Can't be on my pickup. Next. 
Sorry, could you go back for one second? You go ahead. The, the things that look like a horseshoe, those are not horseshoe magnets. Okay, now this, this is a hand, way. but they are. They are, but they aren't. Okay. Okay, see those two screws? Yeah. Okay, you, those go down through the big magnets underneath. So by virtue of the fact that that's connected to the magnet, it is not a magnetized <laughs> hand rest, but it is a magnetically charged hand rest. Right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. You know, this is big two horseshoe magnets. And the reason I chose this one was, this is the only one I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. No, this is one of the early ones. Uh, with the um, big horseshoe magnets and the two coils that everybody thinks is a humbucker, but it tanked. Next. Why am I suddenly hungry for McDonald's french fries? Because mm -hmm. uh, Oh, the arches. Uh, okay. Uh, and this is... It's got a 
what was basically the horseshoe magnet, and once again, we're using the extra flux field uh, to generate more power. Um, suspended, suspended inside the guitar. Uh, and, and, uh, Next, let me see if I get a better picture. Wait a minute, what? Can you go back to that? Go why, back. why was it a seven string guitar, but I, in the in the pattern I only see six strings? Oh, it's, there's four on this side. No, but in the pattern I see six. Oh, it doesn't matter. You can, you can throw a hundred strings on. There is there is pattern to pick up. Well, there was a brief period of time in the in the steel guitar history where seven string was kind of a rage, and it was right around like 37 to 39, right? Yeah, again, the different tuning. And then they went to eight string. <laughs> Yeah, then they went to 10 string. But it doesn't matter if you send a patent that's not actually. No, the patent does. The patent does not address the guitar. It addresses the pickup. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. that's, that's oh, all. That's yeah. all. So maybe he didn't I mean, put a seven yeah. string on it. He just used the the body of the guitar to, for the example. Okay. Right. Now the cool thing about this, and I, I kind of did a picture. This is this coil is what we what Mike Newton and I have named transformer transformer wound. Uh, there's an early National Logo pickup in the National Resophonics is the same way. 